Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to you all to this NCRI Spotlight session on the top 10 research priorities for living with and beyond cancer. My name is Richard Stevens, and on the program it bills me as the NCRI Consumer Lead and Chair of the NCRI Consumer Forum. Both those facts are true. But I'm here because I was the patient representative on the Independent Cancer Task Force, and I am a patient who is living both with and beyond two different cancers. So in one way, this session is all about me. <laughs> in another way, it's actually about you. Quick show of hands, please. How many of you have someone in your family or in your workplace or in your circle of friends who is living with or beyond cancer. That's every hand bar a couple of people I spotted. So it's actually all about us and the people we care about. We have four speakers who are going to be addressing the top 10 topics, one of whom is going to be announcing the top 10 topics. And I'm not going to tell you which one that is. You'll have to sit and wait. When you leave here today, two people on the doors will be handing out cards for you to take with you, which will have the top 10 topics listed. Feel free to ask for another card or two for a friend who hasn't been able to make it because they're at one of the other excellent sessions going on this morning. There will be time, after all four speakers have spoken, for a little bit of question and answer. And then we're going to finish with a video made by some patients and carers a couple of months ago on their views on why these issues are really important to them. So that's enough of me. We're actually going to make a start with the first speaker, which is one of my colleagues on the steering group for this particular project, Kynwin Giles from the Shine Charity. Kynwin. Um, good morning. Thanks, Richard. Um, so my name is Kynwin Giles, and I'm a director at Shine Cancer Support, which is a small national charity that provides support and information to people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who are living with and beyond cancer. Um, and I, I am going to be the person that reveals the top 10, so don't leave till I finish talking. Um, uh, and I guess I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about how we came to the top 10 and why we feel that this is a really important time for patient and carer priorities in cancer research. Um, so there is a massive research challenge, which a lot of you are probably aware of, um, in terms of living with and beyond cancer. In the UK alone, there were 2.5 million people alive following a cancer diagnosis in 2015. But that's estimated to be 4 million people by 2030. That is a huge proportion of people. Um, and the reason that I'm personally interested in this is that I am one of these people. Um, I was on the NCRI panel, um, the Priority Setting Partnership, um, partly because of my role at Shine, but also because I have a personal interest. Um, so I was diagnosed with stage four diffuse large B cell lymphoma um, eight and a half years ago. And I am alive because of advances in cancer research. 20 years ago, someone like me would have been dead. Um, immunotherapy made a huge difference to, the type, difference to the type of treatment that I was able to get, um, and it means that I was alive. I was diagnosed when my daughter was six weeks old, so the fact that I get to see her grow up has been amazing. Um, but it's also not been easy, and I think um, one of the things that no one prepares you for when you're diagnosed with cancer, um, and you're thinking, I just need to get to the end of my treatment, and I just want to live and get back to normal, is that living um, never goes back to normal. And, um, you know, I'm really grateful to be alive and obviously grateful for the incredible care that I've had, but I think we don't pay enough attention to what life is like for people living beyond cancer as well as the increasing number of people who live with it. Um, you can see part of that in the way that the research funds are allocated. So this comes from the NCRI database. Um, you can see that care and survivorship receives a relatively small proportion of research funding. That's not all of the funding for living with and beyond cancer, um, but it gives you a sense of where the priorities have typically um, been sort of focused. Um, 
I think there's an even greater imperative around living with and beyond cancer, not just because people are surviving cancer, but also because so many cancers now, because of advances, are becoming chronic cancers. So at Shine Cancer Support, um, like I said, we support people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s with cancer, and so many of the people that we see are actually living a really long time with cancers that would have killed them 15, 20, 30 years ago. And that's bowel cancer, breast cancer, which is increasingly becoming a chronic condition, a lot of leukemias and lymphomas. And at Shine, we've just started something online which is called the Shine Cancer Support Lifers Group. Um, and that's actually people who are living with an incurable cancer, and that group has grown and grown since we launched a few weeks ago. Um, when NCRI began this journey in 2017, uh, this was the definition of living with and beyond cancer that they used. So it, you know, it's very, um, I think I said broad and then I was corrected by someone who said it's comprehensive. Um, but it, um, it, it covers an awful lot. So you can see the psychological impacts of cancer, symptoms and side effects, late effects and long-term outcomes. Um, one of the things that always surprised me when I um, was given my consent form for cancer treatment is that a side effect of cancer treatment is cancer. Um, so if anyone's ever had cancer treatment, that's always a bit of a surprise. Um, social and economic consequences of cancer, so the number of people who <coughs> struggle to get back to work, who suffer from fatigue, who can't go back to work full time. Enablers to live a normal life, um, as well as research into health economics and health services. So how can we organize health services to support people like me or people like Richard, who are really living with and beyond this disease? So NCRI launched a UK-wide priority setting partnership with the James Lind Alliance. And for me personally, I was really interested in this because I've sat on funding panels before um, where patient involvement is given only kind of two lines at the end, um, a very sort of cursory glance, um, very little funding. And I think involving people affected by cancer the carers and the patients, as well as frontline healthcare professionals, was really important because we need to know what's important to them. And too often there's a massive gap between researchers and patients in terms of what they think is important. So the aim was to identify priority questions for research on the impacts of cancer and cancer treatment. And um, NCRI pulled together a really large group of people to do this with a, sort of a huge range of expertise. Um, we were tasked with looking at all aspects of living with and beyond cancer. Um, it was in people first diagnosed with cancer in adulthood. So the people that, answer, that participated in um, the priority setting partnership were diagnosed um, or supporting someone with cancer who had been diagnosed age 16 plus. There have been other priority setting partnerships around childhood cancer. Um, the steering group, I'm just gonna get my notes here. The steering group was, um, comprised of six patient and carers. It also had five charity representatives, so Shine was one of them. Um, but we were also really lucky to have representatives from Macmillan, Marie Curie, Cancer 52, which looks at rarer cancers, and Sarcoma UK. We had nine healthcare professionals, um, including a GP, two oncologists, two nurses, a surgeon, a psychologist, a research specialist, and a gastroenterologist. So we had little bits of everyone there. Um, two NCRI executives and a James Lindelein facilitator, who was really important um, in terms of facilitating group conversations and making sure we sort of maintained a focus on getting down to a top 10 list when we actually started with thousands of questions. Um, so we began this whole process probably in June or July 2017, and we launched a survey in September 2017 where we asked people to submit what they felt were unanswered questions about living with and beyond cancer. And we were sort of overwhelmed with thousands of questions. So we got 3,500 questions from people. And these were questions people didn't feel they had an answer to. Part of the next phase of our work was going to do an evidence check to see whether some of those questions actually had answers. And there was, what was interesting to me actually was that 1,500 of those 3,500 questions did have some answer or evidence, but people didn't know about them. So I think there's something also that was highlighted in this process about um, research that is being done not being filtered through to patients and patients not being able to find the information that they want. Um, 
we did a second survey um, where we had 1,918 patients, carers, and professionals um, who were asked to rank 54 questions. So we took 2,000 questions and distilled them down to 54. That alone wasn't easy. Um, and those 54 questions were ranked, and we created a short list of 26 questions. And from that, we held a final workshop um, with 32 people where those 26 questions were answered. Um, so this is a, a couple of photos of that workshop. And um, you know, with 32 people trying to take 26 questions and come up with a top 10, there were some really long involved and robust conversations. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a really great opportunity to get everybody in a room together. So much of this work was done remotely or people were calling in or it was being done by email or researchers who were feeding back. Um, so it was, a, it was a great day to be able to, to be in a room with people who actually really cared about getting this right. So um, I'm going to list the top 10. Um, and we're going to go from 10 till 1, so you, know, you can hold your breath and wait for number 1. Um, I will say, I think for me, some of these questions um, are really large and complex, and you'll, you'll see that. Um, and that's a factor of the fact, you know, we took 3,500 questions and came up with 10. Um, but I guess our hope is that everyone who leaves here today is able to say, that when they're thinking of research or they want to fund research or they're coming up with a research question, that they'll be able to look at this list and say, does it relate to any of these questions? Is it important to patients, carers, and, and to some extent, healthcare professionals as well? So the number one, or sorry, number 10 question was, how can we predict which people living with and beyond cancer will experience long-term side effects as well as late effects? And one of the, uh, I think the, more complex conversations that we had in distilling these questions was actually the difference between long-term side effects and late effects. I think there's not, there is some confusion in the general population about the difference between those two. Um, so we felt it was really important to separate them. Um, but we don't know enough about how you can predict which people will experience what after treatment. So I know from myself with my immunodeficiency condition, 5% of people that receive rituximab, which is the drug that gave me my immunodeficiency condition, will develop this. But nobody knows how or why or who. And it would be great if there was more research about how to predict those kinds of things. Number nine, what specific lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, stress reduction, help with recovery from treatment, restore health, and improve quality of life? And I think for me, the, the conversations that I was in in the final workshop, this was a, a somewhat contentious question in the sense that I think patients and, and clinicians tend to have very different views on this. As a patient, you get bombarded by your well-meaning neighbor who tells you you should have a turmeric shake every day um, and that will cure your cancer, um, whereas clinicians don't get that and they think, well, that's a load of rubbish. Um, we did do um, a uh, evidence check on this and there is definitely good evidence for the role of um, exercise in preventing recurrence of cancer, specifically in different type, um, cancers like bowel cancer or breast cancer. Um, there was a lot less evidence around diet, and I think as patients, this was something that people were really interested in. It's something that you have control over, and when you're diagnosed with cancer, too often you feel like you've lost control of your life. Question number eight was, what are the best ways to manage persistent pain caused by cancer or cancer treatments? And this was something that came up a lot in hundreds of the questions that were submitted. Um, there are a lot of people living in chronic pain and not feeling like they're getting supported to actually even have it validated by their healthcare professionals. So this is a really important question for everyone on the, um, on the steering group. Question seven, what are the biological bases of side effects of cancer treatment, and how can a better understanding lead to improved ways to manage those side effects? So are there things that we don't know about what's going on inside cancer patients, which means they react differently? Um, and what difference would that make to people if we knew that we could prevent nausea in certain types of people, or we could prevent pain, or we could prevent different types of infections? 
Question six, and this is when you start to get really bit into really big questions, right? So how can the short, long-term, and late effects of cancer treatment be prevented and or best treated and managed? Um, so we're not expecting anyone just to come up with this one question in a survey, um, but you know, answers, um, research that um, develops answers around this would be very welcome by everyone on our steering committee and the thousands of people that submitted questions. Question number five, what are the short-term, long-term psychological impacts of cancer and its treatment? And what are the most effective ways of supporting the psychological well-being of all people living with and beyond cancer, as, where, as well as their carers and their family? And I think, for me, this is one of the most important questions because the links between physical and mental health, I think we're talking about mental health a lot more, but there is increasing evidence of the mental health impact that a cancer diagnosis has on people. For the people that I work with, people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, there is increasing evidence that younger people suffer from higher rates of loneliness, isolation, and severe depression. There's increasing evidence that post-traumatic stress disorder can be associated with a cancer diagnosis, and that's not something that was widely recognized by a lot of healthcare professionals until recently. Um, and how do we support people to get back to where they want to be after a cancer diagnosis, especially for younger people if they need to go back to work and they're suffering from mental health issues as a result of um, their cancer diagnosis. There's a real need to support them and develop, to develop programs that help them get back to where they want to be. Number four, um, another cause close to my heart. Um, so what causes fatigue in people living with and beyond cancer and what are the best ways to manage it? Um, most cancer patients that I talk to suffer from fatigue to a greater or lesser extent. And I think we don't know a lot about the causes of fatigue, whether they're biological, whether they're psychological, whether it's a mixture of both. And it's something that cancer patients would dearly love an answer to. Question number three, how can care be better coordinated for people living with and beyond cancer who have complex needs? Um, obviously, we talked about the growth in people living with and beyond cancer. We're looking at four million people in 2030, but an increasing number of them are also elderly and they have multiple comorbidity, comorbidities, so they may be suffering from heart disease and diabetes as well as cancer, and how do we um, ensure that their care is supported and coordinated adequately? Question number two um, is a really interesting one, I think. So how can patients and carers be appropriately informed of a cancer diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, long-term side effects, and late effects? How can you get that all into one consultation? Um, but how does this affect their treatment choices? Um, and I think, you know, over the last 10 years, we've seen a real shift in the way that healthcare operates. Um, patients, their voice is getting a lot louder. There's a lot more attention paid to things like shared decision making um, and supporting patients to actually understand their choice. Um, the British Medical Journal has run a campaign called Too Much Medicine, where people, um, where there's evidence that shows that when people adequately understand the impact of their treatment, they sometimes choose less of it. Um, so we need more information about the best way to support cancer patients to understand their diagnosis and to make those treatment choices. I think one of the things that um, when you're in the kind of cancer world you can forget is that actually when you're diagnosed as a cancer patient for the first time, you don't know anything about cancer. I know for myself, I thought that there was one type of chemotherapy. I didn't realize that there were you know, thousands of different protocols that people could use. Um, so we need better ways of informing patients about this. Right, the number one question, I feel like I need a drum roll, um, and it's a big one, so prepare yourselves. Um, what are the best models for delivering long-term cancer care? And this includes a screening, diagnosis, and management of long-term side effects and late effects and its treatment. And one of the things that uh, we spent a long time discussing in the steering group is who this should involve. So we were really clear that we didn't want answers to this question to only involve the health service. We felt that it had to involve primary and secondary care, but also voluntary organizations, self-management, patient organizations, um, and patients who can support each other through other forms of um, support, like online tools, digital technology, et cetera. Um, so these are really big questions, um, no easy answers, I'm sure, um, but I think for us it was, um, it was a really important exercise in trying to 
understand what the general public who is affected by cancer thinks are important and actually and also understanding the gap between what healthcare professionals and patients think. So this is the first time that this kind of um, exercise has been done. It's the first time that clear research priorities have been identified in this area. We feel they're really impactful research questions that will improve the lives of people affected by cancer if researchers know about them. And we really need your help. I know Richard mentioned taking a card for a friend. Um, I've seen some people taking photos and tweeting, but please share these. The NCRI is working with funders, um, other researchers, NHS organizations, Chinovis, Macmillan, um, and the NIHR to try to develop some funding streams for this. Um, but we need people to promote awareness of the research priorities. Um, and you can also register your research and your interest um, at the ncri.org slash um, LWBC, so living with and beyond cancer. Um, and we would love to have as many researchers as possible sort of register their research so that we're able to understand what's actually going on out in the, in the research world and, and encourage people to look at these questions um, more readily. So... That's it. I'm going to hand back to Richard. Uh, this is me. If anybody wants to drop me an email or tweet me, please feel free. Um, and Richard, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. So one of the things clearly I should be doing is getting more exercise, but rather than running backwards and forwards across the stage, I'm going to let the speakers do that. The issue really now is having raised all these questions, as we say in my hometown of Stevenage, what you're going to do about it? So what we wanted to do was actually talk to our chairs of the two most relevant clinical studies groups in the NCRI about what research they already have in hand and what's in the pipeline to be planned for the future. So first up, I'm delighted to welcome the, the chair of the Psychosocial and Survivorship Clinical Studies Group, uh, Galina Velikova. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. It's a pleasure to uh, speak and to follow after the announcement of the top priorities. Uh, I was asked to talk about how our group will respond to the priorities. Let's see. Okay. So what I'll do today is just do a brief history of the work uh, on living and beyond uh, cancer up to now, give you some examples of ongoing portfolio projects of our psychosocial oncology and survivorship uh, group and what kind of expertise we can offer for ongoing work. I'll touch briefly, if I have time, on NHS England quality of life metric project, which is ongoing and I'm involved because I think it is relevant to uh, the topic. And I'll finish with some thoughts on opportunities and challenges. Um, so the history here starts in uh, kind of the beginning of uh, 2000 with the creation of the various uh, psychosocial oncologies, palliative care, complementary therapies group as part of NCRI. Important reviews happened and two initiatives are worth noticing, noting, supportive and palliative care initiative and the National Cancer Survivorship Initiative. So research has been done. Uh, which fed into the independent uh, task force report which actually recommended this initiative to uh, develop the top 10 priorities, but also in Strategy for England recommended starting uh, collecting quality of life data beyond cancer treatment. So moving on to our group, we have uh, 18 members. You can see we are multidisciplinary. And you have to trust me that the nurse and oncologists are not on the screen. They are around the table. It's just what happens when you move slides from one format uh, to another. We have three uh, subgroups, and I'll focus on them in a minute. So what is our expertise? Uh, we have methodological expertise in mixed methods, both qualitative, quantitative. Uh, we have expertise in doing observational studies, but also design of complex interventions. As you've seen, the models of care were kind of uh, top of the priority, and this is where complex interventions models will work. Uh, we have expertise in clinical trials of complex interventions, as well as methodology of using patient-reported outcome measures. I'll refer to them as PROMS from now on, in both clinical trials and clinical practice. And we are working on electronic 
methods for data collection and integration into patient care. So what I'll do now is I'll just describe the three subgroups we have and how they match on JLA priorities. Uh, a group on impact and consequences of cancer and treatment chaired by Derek Kite, who is in the audience uh, somewhere, and it maps on the models for delivering long-term cancer care and on priority number six, uh, looking at the short-term, long-term, and late effects of treatment. We have a group on lifestyle and behavior interventions chaired by Jill Hubbard, which maps onto the lifestyle changes, priority number nine. And we have psychosocial interventions chaired by uh, Professor Mary Wells, which maps onto priority number five, psychological impacts. Uh, so some examples of the studies, our methodological expertise in clinical trials development uh, in the recent uh, few years, there have been uh, patient report outcome specific guidelines for protocol development, trial implementation and reporting. And uh, these were developed by international consensus groups and members of our group have been part of these. So we do have uh, in-depth expertise in uh, the methodology of collecting patient reported outcomes. Uh, then moving on to some of the intervention, remote monitoring of symptoms and side effects during cancer treatment, use of mobile technology. This is a EU-funded study led by Nora Kearney, which is ongoing and results are expected in 2020. Uh, on a similar topic, a study we run in Leeds, NIHR-funded program, online monitoring and then integration of these um, patient-reported symptoms and side effects into the electronic medical records. And we are doing this in chemotherapy treatment, pelvic radiotherapy, and follow-up after surgery. And we expect results uh, in the next year from this study. Of course, it's important to use online technology for new models of cancer care. Again, top priority uh, from JLA exercise. And one example is from True North uh, Prostate Cancer Survivorship Care Program, funded by uh, Movember and courtesy to Alison Richardson for this slide, which looks at supported self-management and follow-up care program that includes online needs monitoring, survivorship care plan, self-management workshop, and, and a system for patients to get back into care if needed. We have experience with large uh, cohort studies of cancer survivors. Uh, Horizons is a Macmillan-funded uh, study looking at patient experiences during and after treatment for breast um, gynecological and non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. Uh, life after, this is led by um, Claire Foster, life after prostate cancer diagnosis is a very large uh, population survey funded by Prostate Cancer UK in November, led by Adam Glazer, who is in the audience, I think, and Anna Gavin, uh, which is at the stage of publishing initial results in 30,000 men. So I believe we will provide some information on the side effects. It's, I think where we have a gap is how we present that information to patients and the public. Uh, then example of lifestyle interventions for cancer survivors, the ASCOT study, which is closed and in follow-up, looking at lifestyle advice for three cancer survivor group. So moving on to NHS England Quality of Life metric project, this came from recommendation 64 of the Cancer Task Force report recommending to develop a national metric on quality of life by 2017, with nearly there. Uh, which will enable better evaluation of long-term quality of life after treatment. It's meant to sit on the cancer dashboard. There's a place holder over here next to overall patient experience, next to other metrics for uh, successful cancer treatment, such as one-year survival. And the purpose is to act as a flag and prompt to improve discussions at cancer alliance level. So it's aimed at provider level. The first phase uh, was done by Ipsos Mori with uh, me as the academic lead. We did scoping literature reviews, stakeholder interviews, and we recommended two questionnaires uh, to be taken forward in the pilot and also to focus on digital data collection in the report to NHS England. What was interesting uh, is the information we had from patients and clinicians the original purpose of the data, so if we look at aggregate data and patient level data and then how it might serve patients and providers, the original purpose of the metric is here. So it's aggregate data to inform providers to improve patient care, to evaluate and improve patient care. Obviously, if we have that data, we can inform patients as well uh, 
that's priority number two of the JLL exercise. But we had, this wasn't meant to be a purpose of the metric, but we had very strong um, feedback from both patients and clinicians, not so much the management, ma ma NHS managers, but clinicians and nurses working with patients, uh, that if they're providing the data, then they would expect to see that data, both patients and clinicians, and the patient would expect the clinician to do something if they report problems. This is difficult to do. We are doing a small pilot within the current pilot work to see how this might, might work, and obviously those who know me know I'm very keen to get this going. Uh, so it's ongoing. The pilot phase in five pilot uh, sites are collecting data, digital collection with backup of paper for patients who don't want to use digital, embedded along patient pathways, uh, and we are testing the data linkage with NCRAS, and there are separate projects for data analysis and creating the metric and then evaluating the process in creating a toolkit for national rollout. Then finally, my final slides on opportunities and challenges. These are really my thoughts. Uh, I think the launch of the top 10 priorities is very important. Uh, it gives recognition and focus on cancer survivorship. Very important is that it's led by patient and public. That should have been higher up. I'm sorry, this is how my brain worked when I was writing the slide. Uh, we hope that it will lead to dedicated funding schemes on a larger scale than, than now. I think that quality of life metric project will open wider opportunities if we see a wider range of data collection across NHS England and will give us opportunities to analyze the routinely collected uh, patient reported outcomes data. Obviously we have the digital and mobile technology, big data, and we have to see how we incorporate patient report outcomes into the big data and the artificial intelligence approaches. We have wide range of expertise within the group and we have international collaborations where we need them. What are the challenges? Um, I think moving beyond pilot studies or single center studies to large multi-center studies. This is very neat, hard to do. It needs more funding. We need larger grants in order to do that. There's a question about study designs. What are the best approaches? Randomized controlled trials are easier to get funded, but is that the right approach? Do we move more towards implementation, science? We need to learn how to analyze real world data, including the patient reported outcomes. And at the bottom there is understanding the biological and, me and uh, molecular mechanisms of symptoms and adverse events. Um, we are not very good collaborating with basic scientists, industry, genomics, mathematicians, etc. Uh, and it's hard to do. We speak different languages. I've tried and failed a few times. Uh, but this is something we do need to face if we want to have deep understanding and actually uh, have hypothesis-driven interventions. Uh, so that's me. Bank on zero? Or am I over time, oh, Perfect, Richard? perfect. Thank you, Galina. <laughs> So that's kind of one half of, of the two CSGs. So we now have coming to the microphone uh, Professor Sam Amadzai, who is the chair of the Supportive and Palliative Care Clinical Studies Group. Sam. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of this panel and uh, part of this really important uh, launch and uh, also to be following after uh, Galina because basically it's what she said is what I'm going to cover as well, with a slight variation, because I'm from a different CSG. My CSG is called Supportive and Palliative Care. Um, and I guess people understand what palliative care is, or maybe they think they do, but very few people actually understand what supportive care is. So just to help you understand, supportive care is defined by MASC, which is the Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer, as the prevention and management of the adverse effects of cancer and its treatment. And it includes the entire spectrum of physical, psychosocial uh, issues right from the beginning of cancer right through to rehabilitation and survivorship. It could have been, that definition could have been written for the, for the JLA priorities. Mm -hmm. So how do we put that into practice? The model that we have, the conceptual model that we use in our uh, support and power to care CSG is this, where right at the top we've got what our uh, colleagues in surgery, oncology do is actually 
to treat the disease, which is the way we get patients into remission and hopefully into long-term survivorship. But underneath that, we've got patients who are actually experiencing the disease, the side effects, need information, and often, or usually under there, there's a family who's also experiencing their own issues as well. They need information, maybe they need financial help. So those two bits together are supportive care. So supportive care supports the patient and the family, actually it supports the oncologist as well to deliver the best quality care. So our group is interested in three kind of discrete areas and right at the beginning we're interested in symptoms and concerns at presentation and very importantly acute treatment related toxicities. Further downstream we have a group looking at symptoms of progressive and advanced disease issues at the end of life and then most recently, we've also now developed an interest in late effects and also in recurrence. So that maps up exactly onto our three subgroups. We have a subgroup called early stage disease and acute treatment toxicity. We have a subgroup called advanced disease and end of life care. I won't say so much about that because we're talking today about living with and beyond cancer. And then we have a subgroup, the newest one, which is about survivors and late consequences. This is a breakdown of the members of our group. We have a number of oncologists, palliative medicine, health service researchers, we have nurses, we have allied health professionals, a pharmacist as well, statistician, and of course two patient representatives. So we have a full multidisciplinary team just within our CSG. And what are the expertises that we have? Well, we have expertise in clinical trials. We've got uh, a member, an oncologist, who does purely phase one trials uh, and acute, looks at uh, acute treatment uh, issues. Phase two, phase three studies. We've got expertise in qualitative research as well, interviews, focus groups, etc. Quantitative, questionnaire design, questionnaire application, surveys. And we're also now developing, building up our, our studies with a translational, uh, forward-driven translational questions as well. So what are the priorities for the sport and palliative care for future research? Well, these are the sorts of things that we are doing but developing more of now. So we're developing studies in exercise, nutrition, and rehabilitation before prehab and also during and after treatment. And we're particularly focusing on the role of allied health professionals, physiotherapists, for instance, and community teams delivering these programs in the community and also working with the charity sector. We're very interested and we've got expertise in measuring and treating treatment toxicities and we're developing now an interest in immunotherapy, but we're looking at physical effects, the patient experience, and again, what's it like to go back into the community, to live at home, to, be a, to go back to university, to go back to jobs with treatment toxicities. And of course, because of our palliative medicine background, we're very interested in the physical symptoms of people with, uh, living with cancer, and that's pain and other symptoms such as fatigue, breathlessness, both in advanced disease, but say so I'm not talking about that so much now, but also very much people emerging from cancer treatment and living for many years beyond. And there we're looking at the hospital community, and interestingly, increasing the hospice community is also contributing to that as well. So where do the priorities fit in? I'm going to show this sort of graphically. So for instance, what causes fatigue in people living with and beyond cancer? That goes right up, up there. Uh, what are the best ways to manage chronic pain? We've got a lot of interest and expertise in that. We're developing studies. We have done, we're developing more studies in that. What, what specific lifestyle changes? We've heard about those already from, from Galena, but we're interested particularly in nutrition, nutritional interventions and exercise as well. What are the effective ways to stop cancer coming back? Well, we wish we knew, but we're interested in looking at what we can help people, people do to, from their point of view to, to prevent the cancer coming back. What are the biological bases of side effects of cancer treatment? So this is moving now into where we want to really understand the molecular mechanisms of pain, of fatigue, of depression, all the various things that people have to cope with. And we understand a lot more now about their, their, their genesis, but also we need to find out how can we stop those mechanisms. How can the short-term, long-term, and the late effects of uh, cancer treatments be prevented and or best managed? So, 
one of the ways of doing that is start right at the beginning. We've learned, like in a lot of areas, if you start early before these, before these effects are deeply seated, then there's greater chance of actually a patient emerging at the other end with, with less of the kind of scarring of those issues. And how can we predict which people living with and beyond cancer will experience long-term side effects? Again, we wish we knew, but what we want to do is to look at are there biomarkers, are there genomic or phenotypic characteristics which can define which patients are going to get peripheral neuropathy, which patients are going to get this particular problem with immunotherapy. So we're looking to see can we develop large uh, databases of the characteristics of patients and then follow them up. We're going to do this with the immunotherapy particularly. And also then, what are the best models for delivering long-term care? This very, very big question. Well, that obviously fits in with, with our whole program of work. And how can care be better coordinated for people living with cancer and beyond cancer? And we, for instance, we're also working with, with the teenage and young uh, uh, adult group as well to see how we can help people from, from that age group sort of go back into normal life. All these priorities are going to need development, not just with ourselves. We can't work in isolation. We, we certainly cannot work in isolation. We have to work with the CSGs, the site-specific CSGs, the ones that are delivering treatment for the individual cancers, with primary care, and of course with psychosocial oncology as well. So these are some of the current uh, studies that we're going uh, doing. We, we, we're We've got studies looking at pain assessment, the EPAP method, which is a quick way of assessing pain in hospital patients, could also be done in the, in the community. New technologies for reducing some of the late problems. One of the most um, horrendous problems of using opioids, for instance, for pain control, which causes a lot of people to stop taking it, is constipation. Sounds trivial, but it's massive. And we're developing, looking at new technologies which can prevent that from, from impact on patients' lives. Fatigue, we've, we're, we're doing we've advanced study studies in prehabilitation before patients go into treatment uh, and then emerging afterwards post-treatment rehabilitation as well. And nutrition is an area that we're developing a, a lot of work with, particularly with something called the NIHR Cancer and Nutrition Collaboration. For instance, we're looking at what support, nutritional support and advice we can give to people right at the beginning when they've got cancer as to how they can uh, best care for themselves or for their family members. And then post-treatment needs assessment, which was mentioned earlier on. This is a study, for instance, looking at an online tool where patients can go on and ex explore in a very interactive way, an adaptive way, up anything up to hundreds of different issues which affect them at this moment. Usually it's only a, a couple of dozen. Um, and then leading that, taking those issues into supported self-management. So, how will our CSG take the priorities forward? Obviously, we have to talk with patients and carers, and we've got to do that at the beginning, at the genesis of every single subject. It's got to be driven, I think, by patients and carers. We have to work with site-specific CSGs to make sure we're actually targeting the right questions, so we have to talk the language of the gastroenterologists, of the urologists, and the hematologists as well, to see what are the issues face they're facing with their patients. And we have to work, as I said, with the other cross-cutting CSGs. So the challenges are funding. As we saw right, right at the beginning, there's been a dearth of funding in this area. And some of the big funders have actually turned their back, literally, on supportive care research. We need to open those doors. Um, awareness, we've got to engage with charities and, and also the other CSGs to make sure that for every study that's developed now, every single cancer study, we look at what are the supportive uh, care issues. And funding again, <laughs> always comes back to funding. <laughs> So the, the priorities, the, the, it's this fantastic piece of work has shown us what the important issues and priorities are for people living with and beyond cancer. The CS, supportive and palliative care CSG is well equipped, got lots of expertise and ready to develop those priorities into studies. And basically we need the NCRI and its partners to open the door for funding. Thank you very much. Thanks Sam. Thanks, Sam. So the past two speakers have essentially been talking about the need for funding uh, in the UK and talking about the infrastructure we already have in place in the UK. But we patients have felt strongly throughout this process that this is not just about the UK. Whenever we meet patients and carers from other countries, once you get over the initial language barrier, the challenges 
and the problems we all face are actually shared. So I am really pleased to have our last speaker today as a representative of the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, EORTC, as I call it, and whenever I'm in Brussels, EORTC, as they remind me, uh, Andrew Bottomley, who's actually going to tell us what the Europeans are already doing and where we can go together next. Uh, an excellent introduction. I would like to say thank you again because this is the second time I've been to the NCRI meetings. I came last uh, year and spoke about the UATC item library. Um, I don't expect to be coming next year because of Brexit. I think my passport will be revoked, but I'll try to uh, keep you informed uh, today about the experiences uh, that we see in survivorship research at a European level, a broad level, and then drill down to some of the activities that we've been doing in the EUITC over the last few years. So you've already mentioned today that survivorship is increasing in the UK, but of course that's also across Europe that we see uh, survivorship rates increasing, and in the US. But we still have a big problem about understanding the long-term side effects of new treatments. I'm regularly involved in developing new treatments, and we can often collect the short-term side effects over one or two or three years, but the long-term side effects are very, very difficult. And we have many barriers there. That's a regulatory barrier and operational barriers to collecting this sort of data. And I think when we look at the research infrastructure across Europe, you will see it's very fragmented. Uh, and we really do require what we call a lot of harmonization of the structures across the EU. We've also mentioned today a lot about the uh, long-term side effects of existing treatment. And I do think there's a lot of information about existing treatments, for example, if you look at pain and fatigue. But some of those have not been researched to their full potential. And I think we have, again, a lot of work to do here. We need to do much better prospective planning of the quality of life and the survivorship research questions. We really do need a sustainable research infrastructure. And again, across Europe, that's very much split with each member state or of each country having their own various uh, structures. And as Sam just mentioned, funding is a critical issue. It's no good having piecemeal funding, a little bit of funding here and there. Uh, and Galina mentioned small amounts of funding. I think you need much more substantial funding if you're going to do long-term uh, survivorship research that's going to have an impact. If you look at the, across Europe, you will really see that the EU are motivated uh, in terms of survivorship research. There are many initiatives. The EURTC, I've been working with ESMO and various other European societies, having a dialogue with the European Parliament. It's very easy being based in Brussels. We can simply get on the metro in 10 minutes, we're at the European Parliament, and we can speak to the parliamentarians and lobby them. Um, you will see that the way to get money from the European Union is to try and get them to issue a funding call under what they call FP7 or Funding Programme 7 or Horizon 2020. There are a large number of survivorship research projects that have been funded. Nevertheless, research is still fragmented. Uh, part of these funding schemes means that you have to fund between three up to 20 partners across different member states. That's a way to get research that's not fragmented and that can have a big impact across the EU. And some initiatives that really have helped are the Cancer Passport, and I'll talk about it in a minute, and support for the European Cancer Patients Coalition that some of you, are, I'm sure, are members of. So the European, uh, European Survivorship Passport is now an online tool where people with uh, cancer from uh, uh, ch children with cancer can actually have this online tool where they can record their treatment, their history of their treatment, their side effects. And as they move across Europe, because the European Parliament expect people to move around Europe for jobs, for their <coughs> career, as they get old, as they move to hospitals and different providers, you can simply log on to this database and have your specific information and give it to your healthcare provider and have it for yourself. Uh, it's been rolled out now, it's been rolled out in Italy initially, uh, and also then it's been rolled out in three or four member states. This survivorship passport should be rolled out across all of the European setting over the next few years. If you look at the work by the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work, 
They're trying to support people getting back into work. They've done a review of what the issues are. What are the barriers for people getting back to work? They're looking at the best practice and they will issue guidelines about best practice for cancer survivors to return back to work. And if you regularly see at the European Parliament, the MEPs Against Cancer, they often meet two or three times a year. You can go to those meetings, you can have a discussion, you put the issues uh, on the political agenda. And I think you need to have a dialogue, or certainly we need to have a dialogue with the parliamentarians to get funding and to get survivorship on that wider agenda. So that's just some of the issues that we're seeing across Europe. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the EYTC and link in some of these priorities to some of the work that we have ongoing and see if there's some overlap here. Now the EYTC is a non-profit organization. We're about 60 years old. We're about 3,000 clinicians and researchers across Europe, many in the UK. And our fundamental job is to undertake clinical trials. There's about 50 or so active at the current time. And these are really international clinical trials about developing new treatments um, and often large clinical trials. And over the last decade, there's been a lot of interest <coughs> in survivorship research. In fact, formally, we started in 2009, but informally, we started in about uh, 2004 when we presented to the US President's Cancer Panel about the priorities for the EUITC in cancer survivorship. So let's just look since 2008, because I think it's relevant to look at the, the newer uh, topics. I'm going to talk a little bit about the survivorship summits that the URTC has been doing, a little bit about the quality of life group instrument for survivorship that's available and that you can use for some of these priority areas, touch upon the URTC's U protocol and talk a little bit about some of the prospective research that are ongoing and again can feed into some of the priorities that you've already mentioned. So the EITC has been doing survivorship summits, that simply means a meeting or a conference for the last four or five years. Every one or two years there's a survivorship summit. And it's trying to unite people from across the EU, clinicians, researchers, uh, social workers, nurses, bankers and policy makers, uh, really to try and promote survivorship research across the EU. It's a challenge to get all of these people talking on the same page. But for example, um, trying to promote quality of life research by developing new measures, trying to change social policy, for example, trying to get better insurance that's applicable to cancer survivors, is something that Professor Monnier, the Director General of the UITC, has been trying to do. And the fourth Cancer Survivorship Summit is planned for 2020, and you're more than welcome to attend and discuss the topics that we've covered today. But it's not just Survivorship Summit. Every two years we do a quality of life and clinical trials conference. The next one is in 2019 in May, and you're all invited to attend as well. This is a free conference where we often have three or four hundred attendees. And survivorship is becoming a critical issue at these conferences. I think the last one we had about a quarter of a day devoted to survivorship, but the next one we're going to probably have half a day. Plenary speakers like Patty Gans will be talking at that uh, meeting. And again, if you're a cancer patient or a representative of a patient organization, the EOTC Quality of Life Group is giving out a number of travel awards, so just simply send your CV come and discuss the issues and the priorities that we've been discussing today. Now, in the URTC, we're evolving how we look at quality of life assessment in cancer patients. I think we've discussed some of these issues already, such as late effects, fatigue, how survivors are impaired physically and the slower performance and discrimination. For the URTC, we've decided that we're going to evolve how we assess survivorship quality of life. And typically, the EYTC is our core tool. It's simply 30 items that we've been using for the last 25 years, where we would use this in cancer patients and in cancer survivors. But some of those issues really are not relevant for cancer survivors. For example, nausea and vomiting is not relevant. So after much debate, the EYTC Quality of Life Group decided to develop a new core survivorship module and add on site specific modules onto that. This module will assess all of the issues that are relevant for cancer survivors. But we're already having another debate by saying, are these static 
fixed measures, these paper fixed measures, are they flexible enough? And as I mentioned last time when I came, we've created an online item library, that's an online tool, with more than 700 of the UITC quality of life questions in that data bank, where you can dip in and dip out. You can choose, for example, a bank of 20 or 30 questions on pain or fatigue or social functioning. There's all of the issues that have been addressed in the priority areas in this item bank. So if you want to do more research on survivors, maybe you should look at that more flexible approach. But the current development is that the survivorship questionnaire is now to be used for those who are survivors and off treatment by at least one year and who are disease free. The data that will be collected for phase three will be finished in 2018. And Lonica van der Poel and Neil Aronson will be presenting this, hopefully, uh, and available for people to use in June 2019. So again, this is a tool that I hope you'll be able to dip into and say, does this suit our needs? Can you use this for some of the priority areas that you've already developed? And it looks simply like that if you want to use it. You're the, use the core survivorship tool. And if you're looking at issues such as breast cancer survivorship, delve into that, or if you want to look at pain or fatigue, use the item library. These are all freely available. You can use these that are pr presented freely for all academics. Very briefly, let me talk about the EUIT's EU, Your Outcome Update Protocol and Infrastructure. We mentioned across the EU that there's no infrastructure for coordinating survivorship research. For those people who are involved in the EYTC studies, there now is an infrastructure. We will systematically be asking cancer patients to agree to have long-term survival and follow-up data collected. So any clinical trial that we'll be doing now, we'll be asking patients and clinicians to consent to collecting all of that data in the long term and prospectively as well. So we'll have clinical data, we'll be collecting quality of life data, and even project-specific data. So if you're interested in the UITC and working with us for survivorship study, uh, then please come and we'll speak a little bit more about that initiative. Again, we've been talking about uh, survivorship studies and the needs of those priority areas. And the UITC has ongoing prospective studies where we're looking at long-term views of women with gynecological cancer for example, where the comprehensive evaluation of the physical and the psychosocial needs is being done on about 800 gynecological cancer patients. This question really is addressing, I think, the NCRI and James Lind Alliance priority number five, uh, really down to almost the letter in the protocol, and also priority area number 25, which you've not seen, but I, I, I guess it may be discussed as well. Again, in long-term uh, and early locally advanced breast cancer, another survey that's been on, undertaken, again, addressing priority area number five of your uh, consensus group. And we're looking at also long-term toxicity in head and neck cancer patients. These are patients who are more than five years post-diagnosis. We're looking at what are the long-term side effects. These are projects and studies that are ongoing, and you're more than welcome to collaborate and work with the UITC on these. These have received major funding from the UITC Quality of Life group. But don't forget retrospective projects as well. Um, I've mentioned prospective projects, but we did have an initiative, I think Galena was involved in this, called PROBE, which is Patient Reported Outcomes and Behavioral Evidence Project. This was a uh, setup really where we got a number of international researchers from the EOITC, from the MRC and the Canadians and the Germans together. And we had a predefined set of research questions and we tried to analyze those by looking at our completed and closed clinical trials. And we were able to amass more than 40,000 patients with quality of life and clinical data. And then we were able to do various analysis of that data to address specific research questions. For example, we looked at whether quality of life is a prognostic factor. Can you use that in the trial? Uh, we looked at whether symptoms are prognostic when you put those together. We looked at whether the patient's view of their fatigue and the doctor's assessment of their fatigue or pain were related. And we looked at the difference between clinical significance and statistical significance. 
I think what we showed was if you want, we have all of those papers that you can look at, but I think it shows that if you collect quality of life data in the long term, don't put the clinical trials to bed. Really try and have a look at that data, try and explore it. There's a lot about survivorship that can be done. And again, the EYTC is more than happy to share that data with you if you have any research questions that you would like to address. I think I would also like to mention about the way that we need to do in terms of improving standards for quality of life research. Galena already touched on two initial projects talking about better reporting of quality of life and better uh, presentation of the protocol. But there's one area that's still not very good, and that's the analysis of quality of life. So the EYTC set up a consortium uh, in 2016. We were very concerned about the standards of reporting of the analysis of randomized controlled trials. And if it's bad for randomized controlled trials, what's it going to be like for survivorship and long-term studies? So we were able to collect a consortium of people who were interested in improving the standards of analysis from randomized trials and look at better quality of life outcomes. This is a consortium of members who were able to get together. As you can see, academic researchers from across Europe and including the UK. Uh, I believe Mel Calvert is in there and I believe Galina is also included in there as one of the academic researchers. But we also have to get the regulators involved. And from the UK, the MHRA and the EMA are actively involved in issuing uh, guidelines. And very, various medical institutes and industry are on the consortium, and academic societies and journals and patient representative groups. So those people got together, and we met over the last two years. We were able to show through very systematic reviews that there is evidence for poor standards of analysis in randomized trials. You can pick up those reviews uh, from the Lancet Oncology this year. We have actually reached consensus in September. There were more than 40 people who got together, looked at the literature, had a debate, and finally we've got to some sort of consensus about the best way to analyze quality of life data. We hope to have these results written up by early 2019. And again, we're planning new work, for example, as I said, if, if there are questions about randomized trials and the low quality of the data. I can only imagine in survivorship research, we would have to work harder, because in, in clinical trials, you have a lot of money and a lot of investments, whereas funding on survivorship studies is much uh, less. So I hope I provided you a little bit in terms of a perspective on the survivorship research that's ongoing. Uh, in Europe. I hope I've given you a bit of a view and that you can see survivorship research is gaining uh, importance in the EU. But I still think across the European Union that research efforts are very fragmented. And I do encourage that we do much more coordinated research because we do have a lot of re research waste. And if we don't promote international collaboration, I think it's money invested sometimes on smaller scale studies that have less of an impact. And of course, the EOTC are very open and supportive to any future collaboration on the identified survivorship priorities today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. If you'd like to come and rejoin us up here, we're, we're going to have a panel Q&A session. So a couple of things before we start. I, I know there are one or two people in the audience who do have mobility problems. So you can either ask the question through the app, or if you prefer, if you just put your hand up, there is a whole squad of NCRI staff sitting on row four, and I'm sure one of them would be only too eager to leap up and sprint with a microphone to where you're sitting. In the meanwhile, the microphones are down the front, and whilst I'm frantically padding, someone will come up to one of them. Let's kick off, Leslie. Guess who? <laughs> uh, Leslie Fallowfield, Director of Shawsey, Sussex Health Outcomes Research and Education in Cancer. Thank all of you so much and everyone who contributed to this massive undertaking and producing, you know, not only the checklist but also your elegant presentations. I've got a couple of things I want to say and then a question. Um, one is that virtually all of the um, 
items that you selected or the group selected do require very clear measurement. So Andrew's presentation and Galena's was particularly useful there. But um, I'd like to give a plug for two o'clock today, measuring what matters <laughs> to healthcare providers, patients, and healthcare professionals. Um, please don't go home. Please come to that. We've got Derek Kite, uh, Angus McNair, and David Seller speaking. So please come along. Um, the, the measurement things are one thing, but you've all addressed this big, big issue we've got about funding. And I remain enormously pessimistic about how we're going to address that. Either my group have lost our touch, or this has been the leanest year ever. Uh, and just as you've identified, you could pick up little bits of maybe 100K here, you know, maybe 50K there, but particularly priority one, that is millions of investment and a lot of people. Now, the second thing I want to ask you all is, you've all given your elegant presentations, and thank you, but what about priority two, guys? Where's the communication stuff? <laughs> well, I'm sure we can answer those in the next 15 minutes. We'll give it a go. Um, I'm going to start with Sam and just work down the line. Uh, I'm not sure which one to Funding uh, and to information. Tackle. Funding information. Um, funding, I, I hinted, I didn't name the, the, the funder. We're hoping that they might now see the error of their ways and, uh, and come back. But, but actually, in the meantime, we've not been sitting on our hands. We have approached many other funders, uh, and we've, we've opened lots of new doors. Not necessarily the big money that we want, but I think that we, we've, we've learned from the, that, those lean years, and we're hoping that that will change now. I don't want to talk about funding, but I'll, I'll try and uh, address the second issue. A big gap, I think, Leslie, you are right, a big gap is the communication uh, with the public and the patients. And some of it is the face-to-face -face communication in the kind of patient care level. Uh, but I also think we owe the public a lot of work on how we present the data we have publicly on websites, leaflets, um, how to present in a way that it's understandable and, and clear for, for people. So I think this is a gap actually in both expertise of our groups and we need to bring in people who understand design uh, and data presentation more. Um, I certainly know that for the LAPSID project there is a, an aspect of it which is looking at how to present the data by different areas, by different stages of disease, etc. But I think there is a big gap there which we need to fill in uh, with hopefully more funding. Okay, thank you, Galena. Um, I'm a big fan. I have to come say hi after. Um, so I, I'm not uh, an expert on funding. I guess for me, my plea would be that I think, you know, obviously we need funders like Cancer Research UK on board, but also we need better patient involvement in projects that are funded. And what I've seen, um, you know, as a patient rep in a lot of cases, it's really badly done. And I think there's, there needs to be a big push on how we make the research that is happening um, more, um, more targeted to what patients need. I mean, that's what these priorities are about, but it needs to go beyond that. It's not just research as usual, which can touch on these priorities. It needs to be research done differently, I think. Um, and communication, I think, is a huge, it's something that we had a lot of conversation about in the steering group. So we would have, um, I don't want to call them arguments, but robust discussions, I guess, about, um, you know, what, is there evidence for this, yes or no? And if that evidence exists, why don't people know about it? Um, but you see, I think it's a really interesting time, right? Um, you know, you have fake news and, and media and stuff, but a lot of good evidence gets drowned out because it's not reported well. And, you know, as somebody that runs a small cancer charity, I feel we are bombarded by people selling snake oil, really, um, but they have really good communications. So we kind of need to up our game, I think. Okay. Andrew. Leslie, it's wonderful to see you again. Um, I think I can talk about both things. I think for funding, it's a big problem for the UK now with Brexit. Um, for example, within the EU, I would like to have many uh, UK partners, as many skilled and gifted people 
we have many EU-funded projects, but it's very, very difficult now to have the UK on our projects from the European Union, from IMI grants or very other grants, because it's very much likely that in the near future you're not going to be eligible uh, to be partners and on those grants, so that makes it extremely difficult. Um, so we have to look for alternative ways to bring in and fund the UK. So that's a big challenge that you, you're going to have to face. Um, for the European setting, of course, we have all these big mechanisms and we can apply for those grants and we can work at those political levels, we can lobby politicians, etc. So that's a, a different... Uh, but I think in the UK you've got to look at that very much deeply over the next uh, sort of few years. And for communication, well, Leslie Fallowfield, you are the world expert in communication about doctors talking to patients. You should be up here on this panel telling us what we should do uh, and do it leading the research project. So I do hope you get funding and that you can apply for some of these research. They don't want to. Yes, I, I'm sorry, but part of that project called Probe, that was a million and a half euro project, and that was funded by industry with EU support. So sometimes industry can be a useful support. You've got to go for their corporate uh, funding projects where you get independent funding and, and they're trying to sort of support this goodness of society. We do do that at the UITC. Yep. We do, of course, have plenty of exhibitors here, including a couple of big pharma, who'd be fascinated to see what's on these cards that you're going to be taking away at lunchtime when you walk around the exhibition hall. I'm just <laughs> mentioning that. There are also consumers in this room who sit on clinical studies groups. So actually, if Cancer Research UK and other funders want to make the most out of every patient, which is in Cancer Research UK's research strategy, then actually should they be having studies embedded in their interventional clinical studies about how the patients feel 5, 10, 15 years after they've had the treatment that Cancer Research UK is helping to fund? There are all sorts of things that we can start doing in dribs and drabs. One other point I'll pick up from what Kynwin said, there is loads of research already done, which from the questions that we were asked, clearly has not reached frontline professionals and patients who need that information. So there is a role to be played, I think, by all the charities and the support groups, people, people where patients go for information and help in actually putting stuff out. How we organize that, I don't know, but the one organization that actually is in a position to do it is the NCRI because it exists to work in partnership with people. That's my plug for NCRI. Hey, I'm living the dream. <laughs> Let's have next question. Hi, Mark Lawler from Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate NCRI for this initiative. I think we should give everybody a round of applause for people. I think this is I think it's incredibly important to identify what the research priorities are because then you can start putting pressure on government, on funding agencies, etc. So again, very much congratulations to everybody involved in this. Just on the funding issue, and I know Andrew is uh, quite pessimistic about the UK in relation to research uh, funding in the uh, European Commission post-Brexit, but I think that's something we have to fight. Uh, we've just published a paper in Lancet Oncology looking at this whole area, first of all, in relation to the amount of research that's being done in the UK. Uh, the UK at the moment leads the funding uh, that's actually secured from the European Commission, 15% overall in terms of health research. So we actually get far more out of the European Union than we put in. There's a danger we could lose up to a billion a year, so this is a very significant issue that we need to address straight on. I'm delighted that the um, Prime Minister has said that she will support early cancer diagnosis. She should also be supporting survivorship, but we need to fight for that and we need to look at mechanisms. I suppose the question I wanted to ask, I very much agree with the last question in relation to communication. But I think we also need to think about the next generation and we need to really be communicating the importance of survivorship and quality of life to our trainees. And I don't think we're seeing that a lot coming into, for example, our education curricula. And that's an important area because they're going to be the future doctors who are going to be having the relationship with the patient in a two-way partnership. So in terms of actually doing that, I think it's very important. And I'd like to hear the panel's view and point on that. And then my second question is particularly to Andrew. Andrew, as you know, we do a lot of work in Eastern Europe. And one of the challenges we face is there's so many other challenges in Eastern Europe in relation to access to screening, access to treatment. 
that the whole quality of life issue, even though it's very much there, it's very difficult. I mean, we work with a lot of the patient or, uh, advocacy organizations there, but it's actually just very difficult to even get that on the agenda because there are so many other issues. So I'd be very interested on your thoughts on that as well, Andrew. Okay, thanks for that. Just to remind people queuing up to ask questions, we, we've really only got about six, seven more minutes, so we may not be getting right to the back of the queues. Andrew, can I just get you to respond quickly to Mark's last point? Yes, thank you, Mark, for the ple pleasant comments and the round of applause. I think in terms of the uh, EU, I mentioned that there is disparity across the member states about quality of life and survivorship. I think you've got to live with that. I know with, uh, within the European Cancer Patient Coalition, uh, the way we promote quality of life, and they have various member states and across Eastern Europe too, is to go to their meetings and promote quality of life, promote survivorship issues, and use them as a lobby group within their various uh, countries. And I think it's a reality that money is short in different member states and the priorities are challenging and the cost of the drugs are very expensive. And so the priority for survivorship will be much, much lower in some member states than, than other member states. So I think I use the European Cancer Patients Coalition as a lobby group and I think that's one way to do it. Okay, and Sam, the training issue. I just want to, yeah, thank you for raising the issue about training and education. I think one of the problems about how we have traditionally organized medical and nursing training education is very compartmentalized. Acute hospital sector, community, and, you know, maybe some sort of, um, uh, sort of outreach services like, like hospices. I think what we need to do is actually trying to join these up. And I would love to know how many medical schools are actually addressing survivorship in itself because it doesn't fit within those categories. We have to have a whole new way of thinking where it fits into the medical curriculum. Um, and so I think that's a really good point because until we actually get young trainees, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, thinking about the continuum of cancer, not thinking it's just a, something that finishes the door patients the day the patients leave the hospital, or not thinking about it, it's only an issue where at the end of life, we're not gonna manage to get that workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Question from over there. Hi, um, I'm Tim Ward. I'm a NCRI consumer. Um, I have another hat on, which is I'm a trustee of the Pelvic Radiation Disease Association, which looks after patients who've had pelvic radiotherapy in terms of long-term effects. Um, I, 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 congratulations to all of you for excellent presentations there. Um, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about the top 10. Slightly disappointed that the late effect was number 10, but hey, it's still in the list. <laughs> Um, and number six, which is the research into finding new ways to predict the uh, late effects agenda. And I'm surprised of all the talks, everybody talked about um, chemotherapy and late effects. Nobody mentioned the R word, which is radiotherapy. And 50% of patients actually undergo radiotherapy at some point for their, for their cancers. And a lot of them do have long-term effects. The research aspect of this is very poor. I could plug now the Requite program, which is a Manchester initiative under FP7, uh, grant for nine European countries to look for biomarkers of radiosensitivity. And it's, biomarkers are a sexy thing now. Everybody's onto biomarkers and genomics and omics. And the research quite clearly is dedicated to detection and prediction of treatment, which is so, but not so much detection of late effects. And going for funding, the reason for that is these funding applications are peer-reviewed, internationally competitive in order to get the money, and nobody likes to talk about side effects. Poo and urine and things like that are not on the spectrum for researchers and toxicity issues, so funding bodies tend to dismiss them. And that's something we really need to change to bring the late effects agenda, the detection and prediction of that into the biomarker arena and get the funding bodies to stand up and say, yeah, we can actually fund some of this. Thanks for that. Let's accept we need to change it and let's ask Alina yeah. how. Uh -huh. Oh, well, I don't know how, but ju just to say, very important uh, question. Thank you for that. And we are doing some work in Leeds in pelvic radiotherapy specifically. I just didn't have time to, uh, to go into that and looking into uh, predicting uh, toxicity and patient reported side effects. Not quite late toxicity. Some of them are kind of intermediate toxicities within the first six months. Um, so some work is ongoing, and, and actually the pelvic radiotherapy toxicity is a very good model uh, that can be applied because now we have some um, models for managing uh, certainly the bowel toxicity, etc. Uh, and I agree with everything else you yeah. say. 
Let's not forget, there is a wilderness of patients out there who've been treated a decade or more ago who are still suffering the late effects. And so acute toxicity still tends to be flavor of the month with a lot of studies. But the late effects is a tsunami waiting to happen. They're not going to go away. With the numbers of patients coming through by 2030, the number of patients with late effects who were treated now, five years ago, are going to still be there. And we need to do something about this. Yep. Thank you, Tim. Time for one last question, so I'm going to take the one down the front. Hi. Um, I work at the ICR, but I am also living beyond uterine cancer. And I used to run a support group for young adults, and it's great to see young adults involved. But I was wondering um, if there was any opinions and considerations for people who were, um, had cancer when they were children and are living beyond cancer from that, because... I mean, the side effects and late effects are, the incidence is higher and they're also a lot more severe. Um, and I'm sure the priorities are probably similar, but might be different. And I was wondering if that was considered. Um, there was a separate, I think there was a separate PSP, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a separate priority setting partnership looking at childhood cancer. So that was the reason that we, um, for this one, designed it so it was 16 plus. Um, but definitely, there are a lot of issues, you know, things around like infertility, for example, um, which would emerge as a result of treatment for childhood cancer, which are also issues for younger adults or, you know, people in their 40s even um, these days. So, yeah, we did discuss that, but because there had been a separate PSP, we didn't want to um, sort of duplicate the work that had been done on that. Okay, and very briefly, a second half of that answer from Professor Greenfield. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, so I can uh, partially answer that. So I'm uh, one of the, um, uh, the nurses who are on the steering group, and um, uh, we just, that was a question that was asked by the NCRI board when we took the JLA proposal to the board and why we weren't including them. So we felt very much that the children and young people deserved their own research setting priorities, and that's a piece of work that needs to be done. Maybe Ian Lewis wants to answer that, but uh, we will be doing that, and they need to have their own discrete um, research priority setting, and that will happen. Thanks very much. Just before everyone makes a rush to lunch, I'm being buzzed and beeped up here. We do have just enough time for the video. Can we launch video? In 2014, I was diagnosed with a rare form of soft tissue cancer and given three months to live. I was diagnosed at the age of 42 with cervical cancer. In 2004, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. You feel a real loss of control when you have cancer. One thing that I would like to see happening is more of an equal footing between patients and their healthcare professions and more of a recognition that the patient has a voice. What's very special about this project is that it is research questions that have come from patients and their family members, and from doctors and nurses, not necessarily from the research community. Yeah, the process started with three and a half thousand questions. They refine and refine and refine. It's like squeezing a whole load of oranges and you get one can of absolutely superb juice. So we had a very large steering group with over 10 patient and carer representatives, including the charities. We then ended up with a workshop day where we invited patients and carers to come along and thrash it all out. There were tears, there were heated discussions, but in the end, I, I think we have got 10 questions which are of importance to large numbers of people who are living with and beyond cancers. Out of all the priorities, I think the ones that are most important to me are dealing with all aspects of aftercare. The psychological effects of cancer can be devastating. It hits you there at two o'clock in the morning. You're worrying about your treatment. If you've been treated, you're worrying about whether it's going to come back you have to learn ways of handling it. One of the things that I feel very, very strongly about is um, physical exercise and getting out and doing. Initially, you just feel like, oh my gosh. And at that point, you just kind of fall down a well and you think, well, I, I can't do anything. There is nothing that, I, that can change what is going to happen to me. But actually, you can't sustain the misery forever. 
The two priorities that really stand out for me are the issue of fatigue uh, during and following treatment and then secondly the long-term side effects of treatment, the consequences um, of your treatment. My message to researchers would be to please have a look at these priorities, act upon them and get patients involved in your research. It has to be seen as a call to action. I think of them as a plea from the cancer community that this is what we want. Better communication, less side effects, better counselling and care. We want all those things. We know it's possible. Success for this project for me would simply be more people knowing that there is life with cancer, there is life beyond cancer, and that actually they will be able to have whatever it takes to help them find that life and to find their new normal. Well, it's fabulous, it just needs a little bit of editing. I think you could take one person out quite happily. Um, anyway, thank you very much for coming. That video is now on the website. The website is going live. The cards are there. Do feel free to take the top 10 questions up to a funder and say, it's our taxes, it's our donations that you're spending. Enjoy your lunch, enjoy your conference. Thank you all. <laughs>